preface, what I have to say is that I, I haven't got um, anything like the wonderful uh, pictures that you got from, from Alistair. I haven't got the wonderful video that you got from, from Linda. Um, this is going to be rather doer, but, but I do have um, I do have one one thing is that um, we talked about the Rex that we can't call it the Rex. I have to tell you that we I, I, originally I did want to call my organization the Professional Organizations Research Network, <laughs> and um, we thought that would just get too much attention on the website. So, uh, we're very happy to call ourselves PARN. Um, um, right, so um, this, these are the things I'm going to talk about. Um, this was my, my sort of brief uh, 21st century challenges for professionals and 21st century challenges for professional institutes. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about three, competition, automation. I'm going to spend a fair bit of time on automation because it's a new and exciting topic for me. Um, and uh, also trustworthiness and authenticity, which we've heard some things of already. Um, and then how to meet the challenges. Um, what can professional institutes do to meet the challenges? And I'm going to look at it both sort of internally, um, relations with member, with members, and then um, externally. And I'll, I'll concentrate on that third one. Um, just to tell those of you who don't know um, about PARN, um, uh, Professional Associations Research Network, associations, um, and, well, it's, that's trouble because we, we also have regulatory bodies and learning societies, so probably should be professional organizations and research networks. Um, we've got about 125 members, mostly in the UK, but in a few other countries. Um, and we are a, a, a knowledge center. We've been going since 1998. We've got, we're a knowledge center for pretty much anything that would be of, of, of interest to uh, people running professional, professional bodies. Um, we've done a lot of work on, on governance, on CPD, um, and in fact, I've been involved with um, what used to be the Institute for Archaeologists um, on, on governance and, and, and CPD. Um, we, um, we, we, we have lots and lots of stuff going on, and I just wanted to, Peter said, shame, shamelessly, um, you know, mention these things, but some of you may be interested. Um, we have a, this is the latest, um, we, we, we produce every year uh, something called the Professional Body Sector Review. Um, and um, in fact, there's an article in here by none other than Peter Hinton yeah. um, on, on governance. This is a kind of omnibus of various different issues of interest to what we call the professional body sector. I've got a few copies here if anybody wants, but also it's available online um, on our website in a page turning version that's freely available. Um, the other thing we're doing, um, which is also interesting, I don't know if he's here actually, but we've been doing um, articles in Newsweek magazine, um, little thumbnail, thumbnail sketches of individual professionals. And um, we, we've done uh, maybe about 20 of them so far coming out obviously every week. Um, and we do, there is one in here uh, by, uh, about Jerry Waite. He's not in the session. Okay. Well, anyway, so there's. Do we? So anyway, I've got I've got a few of those, and then then there's a bunch of other things that that, that we're that we're doing um, training. We we offer training for people to be working in professional bodies, and we run conferences, and we've got webinars, and those are some of the things that are coming up. All of this stuff is available on our on our website if you're interested. Okay, well, let's uh, start with the challenges for professionals and professional institutes. Um, competition, I think that's already been mentioned. Uh, competition, you know, what happens with uh, the, the, the new uh, uh, young Z archaeologists, ar 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 um, you know, might, might be a, a, a new source of competition. A lot of older professions um, widening jurisdictions. I've just spoke to somebody who is the, from a, another professional body, I won't say which one it is, who's thinking of, kind of expanding um, their growth through, you know, moving into slightly uh, related um, areas of, of potential members. Um, the RICs have expanded enormously from what you had originally been straightforward um, surveyors towards 
um, many, many other activities, and that's source of competition. And also, uh, I mean, competition from companies, um, especially for um, learning and development. Um, we now have, you know, the learning organization, and to some extent that, for a lot of individuals, you know, that kind of replaces the need um, to be, uh, to join a professional institute, to be a professional even. <coughs> hasn't gone quite so far as um, the Japanese model where you know you sing the company song at the beginning and you, you know, the main knowledge is about about that about the company, that's the your learning and development. But there is an element of that and it's a different knowledge source that you need to be need to be aware of. Um, but there's also this indirect competition which um, was um, mentioned very, very much by, by Robert um, in terms of uh, the newer generation getting their information in a very different kind of way. So you're kind of com competing against that set of people who are sitting in their cluttered rooms learning all kinds of things and don't need to, to join up with, with, with something. There's also the, the glamour of, um, of other forms of, of celebrity. You know, what, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, you know, I want to be on Big Brother or I want to be the voice or whatever, you know, I don't want to be an archaeologist, I want to be one of these other sorts of things. Um, so that, that, that can, be, can be quite important. And the other thing, of course, is that a lot of professional um, stature and respect is undermined by the fact that uh, alternative opinions are available uh, on the net and then um, can easily be challenged. There is an element of people returning from professional activities to becoming uh, to, to doing doing it in an amateur in an amateur way, uh, I think amateurism uh, is 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 a new a new trend, um, which is a reversal of the huge long run trend of the last two hundred years, and also competition for for time. Um, most of you, um, so most professional bodies. And many of you are act as volunteers um, to support your professional body. Um, there are a lot of other things you could do with your time, um, such as um, gaming and um, interacting on social networks. So I think that's a, a, big, a big challenge um, that, that is just going to grow and grow. The challenge I want to particularly talk about is automation. Um, because normally you think of automation as you know fairly Fairly straightforward tasks get get automated, where you know a, a programmer can specify you know pretty clearly all the different possibilities, and you know there's only certain kinds of tasks that, and you think, well, we're professionals and we have to um, react to uh, immediate situations, difficult situations, and and make decisions which are not necessarily just routine. But these days, with big data, with machine learning, with machine vision and other um, uh, artificial intelligence techniques, um, a lot of those kinds of tasks that you would have thought were, um, uh, were protected from this form of automation um, are, are actually being, <coughs> being computerized. If we take the example of the driverless car, I mean, it is almost, almost a bit of a problem. Head around the idea. When people talk about driverless cars, I think, well, what are they? Are they on a track? You know, is, that, is, that, is that why they're drive, drive, driverless? No, these are driverless cars <laughs> out there amongst all the rest of us, you know, potentially bumping into us. So how can they do that? How, how can they possibly well, we're into that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the big uh, ways that they can, uh, and I want to talk about this a bit later, is um, this Lindar. Lee, sorry, LIDAR um, technology, laser illuminated detection and ranging. If you think of a bat, it's, it's, it's like that. It's you know, sending out laser and receiving that information back. It was mainly in, in, in the military in order to identify targets and decide how to destroy them. But it's also used, um, it, it's used in archaeology in, um, in terms of mapping, uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, I think that that can be can be really really important, and that's where, in some ways, you know, these driverless cars are less likely to bump in to us because of these other aspects. They're not, you know, they, they don't behave differently after a big lunch. 
I'm sure you've seen that, I'm sure they don't suddenly decide they're going to, you know, stop and, and talk on the phone um, when, and get all emotional about it rather than paying attention to the road. So, so to some extent, these things are really, really happening. Now, there's this really interesting study, I was very excited reading it, um, uh, by a, a couple of these are people from Oxford, but they used American um, data and they analyzed 702 different occupations um, and um, they through their uh, knowledge about the way our nation is going have decided that 47 percent of American jobs would be automated in the next 10 to 20 years so pretty much everything um, that's really 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 scary the first thing I want to say before I go into and I'll show you where on the list Archaeology is. <laughs> um, I mean, up until now, most professionals are not haven't been too worried about computerization because it's been for that first purpose that it enhances. You know, if you think of the surgeon and having all the the different techniques and, and machines that are available to them, it hasn't replaced the surgeon. It's enhanced the surgeon. But of course, the other way that technology can work is that it can take the job away. Completely. Um, this is why, when you see, you'll see the list, but this is, these are the main things that you need to enhance because these are the ones that are harder to automate. So, first of all, there are more physical kinds of things um, perception in a cluttered field of view, um, getting around awkward corners, dealing with you know, problems that can happen, instruments get broken, how do you, you know, or, or, or drop, that sort of thing. And also, apparently, um, you know, computers tend to be quite hard things, and trying to get something that's got that sensitivity, that touch sensitivity that humans have, is, is quite a difficult thing. So, um, and that might be interesting for archaeology, because a lot of it right, does depend on, on, on careful, careful touch. The next one is about creative intelligence, um, which is harder to computerize, partly because you know we're talking about new ideas, unfamiliar um, um, uh, ways of putting things together, and especially that second one, and that is, well, what is creative anyway? Um, creative depends on your values, and those values are continually changing, and they're different in different societies. So what's regarded as creative in one area may not be now it's very hard to automate that. And then the other one, and they do mention public relations specialists as being particularly immune, though you'll see where they come on the list. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, is, um, social perceptiveness, negotiation, persuasion, those sorts of things. Now, I think in archaeology, a lot of these things are part of what you do. And the lesson, of course, is that you really want to be enhancing those bits that you do. You want in your curricula to be teaching that. You want this to be part of your CPD. That's that's the real lesson from this, rather than for you just to get scared. Um, I guess you won't get that scared when you see it there. What did you say? Did you say out of 33? I thought it was 634. I'm obviously suffering from a serious division. No, no, no. Public relations, not much better. It was, uh, oh, it was the other way around. But it's yeah. Just, yeah, this is the, the, the top one. Rec a recreational therapist is going to be the hardest thing to automate because it's going to involve lots of creativity, values. It's, going to, um, it, it, it's all about negotiation. And it's a social sort of thing. Um, I mean, they did this scientifically. They, 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 they defined those three things even in more detail, and then they judged them. They had several panels. It's, it, it's reasonably robust. Obviously, there's judgment involved. Well, you're not doing too bad. 39. 39 least, 39th least likely to be automated out of the 702. Um, not so good for accountants. <laughs> Not quite so good for surveyors. Anyway, um, the, the next um, challenge is about trust and authenticity. We've already heard 
um, quite a bit uh, about that. I mean, obviously, uh, it, it, it affects you all, you know, Shipman, Enron, it's, it's about, you know, losing trust in, in, in professionals, and that has, has uh, an effect. You certainly heard about Generation Z being uh, it's less of an ideal for them. The media celebration of entrepreneurship and creation of celebrity through non-work life is, is important. Um, and this authenticity thing, I mean, where does it come from? It's, it's, it's the big new thing, authenticity, authenticity. I think some of it comes from reality TV shows, that the appeal of reality TV shows is that it's supposedly real. And one of the, you know, of course it's not, but it's, it's, it's celebrating something that could be real. And of course there's the negative side, the concern that um, all these um, generations of people were sitting in their room, you know, working away, who are they? Communicating with who is that lovely group that you put on actually interacting with authentic, authentically? Mm -hmm. So, th those are the big, big, big things. Now, how, how are professional institutes going to meet these challenges? Well, I think they obviously you need to be more strategic, more professional. The professionalization of professional bodies is something that I've been cracking on about for, for ever since Parn, Parn started. At the top, you know, you, the governing body has to be more, more professional, um, more concerned with consistent long-term strategy and, and uh, comprehensive risk assessment. Um, I, I, I have to be careful, but you know, having a certain number of people on your on your governing body who are there not simply because they've been elected, but also that they've been selected, some degree of competence requirements. Doesn't, not for all, but you know there are certain competences that you want to make sure that you've got on your on your governing body, and then um, the usual things that you would expect. I mean, oh my God, the governing body. We're we're august. We know we know everything. No, not at all. Um, induction, CPD for members of the governing body, ter terribly important. Similarly, with the staff. I mean, what we're what we're seeing and what I think will continue to grow is a higher proportion of staff involved in, in, in policy work um, and increased training um, and, and hiring people who are experienced at doing, doing that, at running professional bodies um, and obviously uh, taking part of courses is <laughs> an important thing to do. Um, in terms of member relations, I think the big thing is CPD. I mean, it's started in the 1980s. There are many different professional bodies at various different stages in terms of CPD. Um, Alistair talked about where um, CIPR is at, which is, I think, still a fairly prim prim primitive stage of, of CPD. When it's not compulsory, but it's becoming compulsory. I remember having long chats with Peter about, do it, don't worry do it, and your fear that you'd lose all your members if CBD became compulsory, and lo and behold, you haven't. And I think there's the next step on CPD, and that is, that, you know, CPD does have a bad reputation on a lot of professionals as a tick box exercise. There is a problem of CPD by counting up hours. I think moving towards output measures of CPD, making it clear that the reason why people are doing CPD is to improve their practice and that they need to report on how what they did has affected not just their knowledge, but also their practice, and even more important, the outcomes for, for clients or for employers. All. That's the way it's going, and I think that's very, very important to encourage that for more and more professional bodies for meeting the 21st century challenges. Um, accreditation of sources is, is very important. Lots of you are into the accreditation game, and I think that that's, that's, that's very, very useful as well as potentially maybe making some money. Um, and then there's opportunities to go beyond current practice. I mean, again, this kind of connects with, with Robert's talk, where um, generations that don't want to just do one thing, they want to have the opportunity to do lots of things, and CPD can be a way of opening your eyes to lots of opportunities and to give professionals the, um, the confidence that you can move, I mean, hopefully for, um, for, for the Archaeology Institute, 
in new and different areas of archaeology, but it could be in new and different areas, of related areas of, of professional development and personal development. And I think all that's very, very important. The new thing for for um, C CBD in order for it to fulfill the, 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 the promise that it has, um, which is that no longer is it that you're a professional because you've got your qualification and that's the end of the story. <coughs> that's the real fundamental change. The, you're not a professional just because you're qualified. You have to continually learn, you have to continually develop, which means you need to have some kind of uh, relationship with a professional body. Demonstrating to um, members that they're take, that you are taking the charter seriously, well-designed ethical code, widely available, um, support for understanding the, the spirit of the code, which Linda talked about, they're very, very important. Um, and also, uh, must take seriously complaints and discipline, needs to be done carefully, needs to be done visibly. Members need to know, you know, it's, it's, it's we don't, um, hide our bad apples because we think it's going to hurt the reputation of the professional body and the profession. Rather, we almost celebrate that if people misbehave, we take it seriously. It's like um, it's like recall of cars. Um, you know, it, it used to be oh no no they would never recall, and then suddenly they realized well actually people appreciate if the cars are being recalled it gives people more. Cars driving. So I think that's a very important thing. Um, a lot of what I've said about relations with members is of course very important for the public, the wider public as, as a whole in terms of transparency in operations professional bodies. We're gentlemen's clubs, you know, you know, maybe we'll tell our members, but that's about it. It's, it's got to go beyond that um, and, and the procedures need to be wider. Measuring Public, to me, that's one of the biggest things for the 21st century. Um, professions, you know, we all believe in our hearts, being a professional means you're better. You provide a better service. Uh, the public benefits. Prove it. Mm -hmm. Prove it. Because there will be people who will say, nah, it's just self-serving. Mm -hmm. Of course, you would say that, wouldn't you? That needs to be challenged, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges for the 21st century for professional bodies and professionals together to do, be able to do that. Um, the last, this is the last slide. Um, I, I got very excited by this uh, lidar idea, sort of light and radar, and you know, being a bat and that sort of thing. And I think, in a way, lidar organizations would be um, important. So that the professional body needs to go beyond looking just at what the members are doing and begin to see what's going on in the world. Automation is one of the areas, obviously new legislation is, is, is another one, various culture changes, all that sort of thing. So to be able to um, to act as, as, as a information gathering source, but also once you've got it, it's not about destroying the target, it's about becoming uh, a beacon. So both the lidar is sort of the, the, the bat, but also to, to, to be um, a, a beacon because each professional body and profession needs to show its knowledge center, its you know, knowledge center and research. Um, and I think, of course, standards, all those things are important, but it's very important that, that these things are displayed. And a number of professional bodies are very, very good at this sort of thing. I think the RICs are very good. Um, a lot of the accounting bodies tend to be you know, very, very good at this um, through partnerships with academics and, and others to build um, a reputation as as a knowledge as a knowledge center, so I think that's that's very important. And um, and, I, and I don't even have a, a lovely slide at the end. Um, <laughs> um, that's that's it. <laughs>